How long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. That's the question that came from a random gathering of Jews during the Festival of the Dedication. We know it as Hanukkah. It's a commemoration of the rededication of the temple after invading Seleucid forces captured it, desecrated it, and put an end to worship in the temple for a few years around B.C. 167. Understandably, this really ticked the Jews off, and they organized a revolt that was eventually successful in retaking the area and reestablishing worship in the temple about three years later. Hanukkah was established in about 164 B.C. In the minds of the Jews of the first century A.D., whose Hebrew heritage even then already went back thousands of years, this was fairly recent history. It's hard to understate the expectation of the Jewish people and what they had for this one called the Messiah. Messiah is the Hebrew word that's translated in the Greek Septuagint as Christos, and obviously where we get our word Christ. It means anointed one, and it's connected to the ancient Jewish practice of prophets and priests and kings anointing their successors the ones who would carry on their vision and work for the protection and restoration of the Jews. Before the restoration of the second temple that resulted in Hanukkah in the second century BC, the idea of Messiah seemed sort of loosely defined and had to do more with anointed leadership in general and and spiritual restoration. So it's pretty accurate to say that Hebrew history is actually full of messiahs or Christs. Every time you see someone selected for leadership and anointed in the Old Testament, that person would qualify as a messiah of sorts. After the establishment of the festival of the dedication or Hanukkah, only 160 or so years before Jesus, Jewish messianic expectation seemed to shift a little bit and became much more specific and individualized. Messiah was more often associated with a particular person and not just another in the line of generic anointed ones. Because the Jews seemed to be so frequently in need of inspired military leadership with all the invasions and exiles, Messiah needed to be a military conqueror, anointed as king, Because they were a people of the temple and of of Yahweh, Messiah was also to be anointed as high priest and a religious leader. And because they so frequently found themselves on the business end of the convicting words of spiritual reformers like Isaiah and Jeremiah, Messiah was to be anointed a prophet. All three roles wrapped up in one, prophet, priest, and king. This isn't an overstatement about the Jewish expectation of what Messiah, Christos, was to be. So when the people present that day in Solomon's portico around the time of Hanukkah questioned Jesus about whether or not he was the Messiah, it was a big question. It was loaded with undertones and expectations. Maybe Jesus was the long-awaited one the culmination of prophet, priest, and king. The only problem was Jesus never agreed to any of it. As humans, we've never really had a problem figuring out what we want and what we think is right. seems like whenever and wherever you see society as a whole, there are always groups that form, tribes, People who want the same thing or think and believe the same way. Those who have similar values or or maybe a lack thereof. Humans just love grouping together. A few obvious groupings we immediately recognize would be different religious sects. Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, on and on. Even within those groups, there are different groups, all based on affiliation an agreement. In Christianity, we call them denominations, little and sometimes not so little differences down through the history of the church. 
provided opportunities for peeling off and forming subcategories with their own understandings of theology and scripture. So combine our tendency to group up with the fact that humans have become experts at projecting our expectations and perceptions onto God, and you've got a recipe for trouble. God reveals God's self to us in the various miraculous ways that that happens, and we say, yeah, yeah, that's all well and good, but here's what we think about you, and here's how we perceive you and what you think and what you want and what you should do. So we'll take it from here. We'll let everybody know who you are and what you want. I think it was Voltaire who said, In the beginning God created man in his own image, and man has been trying to repay the favor ever since. The overwhelming tide of this armchair expertism we've been experiencing over the past few years is, is really nothing new. It's practically part of the human condition. Everybody knows best, or at least better than those folks over there. We've got God all figured out. We've got the Messiah all figured out. Now, if he would only just get on board. <laughs> when I stand back and I look at it, I have to confess that I find it all a little ironic. This message that is, in, in reality, older than Jesus, the motivating and central story of God's action in history, God's involvement with people, when we boil it down to its most basic parts, has to do with unity and restoration. Restoration of this union with God and with each other it has to do with the deep longing and need of the human heart to find or maybe rediscover that our ultimate home is in God. And what ends up happening? separation, division, spiritually and religiously, yes, but in countless other ways. We create separation between each other in nearly every part of our lives, and we're constantly trying to find ways to fix this separation we think exists between us and God. This sense of God being out there and us being down here. Maybe if we believe the right way and do the right things, we can heal that divide and somehow pull God down. And sometimes if we're gut level honest in the middle of the night when things are really bleak and hopeless, we can even begin to experience a sense of separation, of disconnectedness from ourselves, out of touch with our own identity and purpose. We call Jesus the Messiah. But when you look at the Gospels especially, it becomes clear pretty quickly that who Jesus was and who he became and what he taught and said about himself and about God had surprisingly little to do with the expectations that were placed on him by the Jews or anyone else for that matter. Jesus confounds us. Jesus goes beyond our ability to separate him into this camp or that camp. He supersedes our need to be in the right group that gets to say what God thinks. Listen to his answer to the Jews gathered around at Solomon's portico when they asked him if he was the Messiah. I've told you who I am by what I do, but... You don't trust it because you're not in my herd. If you're in my herd, then you won't be deaf to the sound of my voice. I know my sheep, and my sheep follow me. Jesus wasn't saying that these people couldn't be in his herd. He just says that they won't entrust themselves to their unavoidable reality in God. He uses this action verb that I absolutely love. I know my sheep. I perceive them. It's got a very intimate connotation in the original language. He's not singling out his sheep from the rest of the world to highlight a separation. Essentially, 
Jesus is saying, here's who you want me to be. And here's who you are in me. And that's really where the separation is. It's this perception that keeps them and sometimes us from entrusting ourselves to the reality that Jesus is showing us. The Father has given me the herd, he says. It's done. The herd has eternal life. No one can snatch them out of my hand. The truth about who I am, the truth about me and God is greater than anything and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. And then Jesus drops the bomb they were asking for but would never be ready to hear. The Father and I are one. It's a shame that the gospel reading start, stops at verse 30 because 31 really reveals the weight of that one statement. Jesus says, I am, and the Father are one. And the very next verse says, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. They weren't ready to hear it. They were deaf to the sound of his voice. And what I wonder is, do we hear it? Are we ready for the truth of the anointed one? Or, or do our perceptions of ourselves and of, of God allow us to persist in this nightmare of separation from God that has never and will never be a part of God's reality about us? It's easier to hide in the safety of the shadows of Solomon's portico, ready to throw rocks, than it is to face the ramifications of Jesus being God in flesh. It's easier to hope for your own version of Messiah than it is to accept the redemption that God's anointed one represents. Elsewhere in John, Jesus prays for his friends. Father, let them be one as you and I are one. A closer translation is, let them be as you and I are. It's a tall order. Sometimes it seems like an unimaginable prayer. And on the other side of it is a frightening sense of freedom from guilt and shame and an opportunity for you and I to live without the weight of the responsibility of somehow working our way into heaven. When the issue of eternal life is dealt with, and it is, then begins the real work of seeking and serving Christ in all people, loving your neighbor as yourself, striving for justice and peace among all people, and respecting the dignity of every human being. But most of us are too busy trying to be good enough to get into heaven to worry about any of that. What a trap. This morning, or this evening, depending on when you're listening, I want you to hear the heart of God about you in the psalm for today. If it helps you to close your eyes and just listen, feel free to do so. Even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you don't have to be afraid. I'm right there with you within you, protecting you and covering you, even in the middle of situations that seem hopeless, when it feels like everyone is out to get you. You and I will sit down and have a feast together. You are my anointed one, and I'm only ever going to keep filling your cup to overflowing. And my goodness and my mercy will follow you everywhere you go for the rest of your life. And when you lay that old body down, we'll still be together. You in me, and me in you, forever. <laughs>